An Easter Lily from An Easter Lily. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Perry. An Easter Lily by Amanda Minnie Douglas. An Easter Lily. She had such a fiery temper, this little Alice Dane, and with it all the sweetest face imaginable a generous heart and willing hands there had been three big boys when baby alice came and they had loved her and teased her she was her father's idol so the poor delicate mother could not make much headway and now she had gone to a german spa and had begun to improve alice was sent to school trevor hall was a sort of home school with never more than twenty-five boarders a pretty large old-fashioned country house with windows and sunshine everywhere mrs dane and mrs trevor had been schoolmates in their youth alice was gay and eager and not self-seeking but occasionally there was a whirlwind at home she had fairly danced with passion but after two or three outbreaks she was a little ashamed other girls controlled their tempers and mamma was always making sweet entreaties on this subject mrs trevor had proposed two things for easter the girls were studying botany and much interested every girl was to take a bulb or slip or seed and see how near to easter she could make it bloom it would be a good study of care and conditions the other was an experiment in self-culture that called a flush to some of the faces girls mrs trevor said smilingly i know you have often made me an easter gift i am going to make my own choice this time i want every girl to write down her besetting sin or worst fault and then set against it every time she has conquered it some of you are untidy some indolent a great many forgetful and careless others given to exaggeration then if you will hand them to me on easter even you know the old jews had a scapegoat they sent out in the wilderness bearing the burden of their sins oh but mrs trevor that would be making you a sort of scapegoat said one girl with a very red face no we will put them all in the fire that will be the scapegoat and i shall be proud of every time a girl has conquered any bad habit it will benefit you and i shall feel that you were willing to make the effort for my sake it was a novel endeavor the girls really did try you could see the difference in the school may anderson was alice's roommate in the large rooms with two windows there were two beds may was very careless she slung things about no other word expresses it alice was neat and orderly for a little girl it seems a funny gift said edith maines to hand over your faults oh if we could get rid of them that way it is for the effort and discipline explained another i've had some difficulty in telling things just as they happened and i've made trouble for myself without meaning to be untrue and i find it helps me with my lessons and i have been learning that most of the faults you indulge in add to the burden of some other person you gratify your own self-will as for the flowers they had varying fortunes some were forgotten and dried up some had too much nursing others were left to take their chance one girl had splendid luck with a pot of sweet alisum that was a mass of white bloom there were hyacinths crocuses geraniums primroses and the ordinary plants that did not require a wide knowledge alice had chosen a bermuda lily they were not as plentiful then as now last spring she had spent a month at bermuda with her parents and had fallen in love with the sweet white blossoms she had studied the soil she had never neglected it a day and it had thriven wonderfully such a stout stalk such deep green leaves and then a bud head growing larger and larger showing white in their long points just ready to burst open it was almost like a living thing to her and somehow suggested tall pale mamma she put it at the other end of the window to catch the last rays of light and stood a chair a short distance away while she went to mrs allen's for her cloth skirt that had a bad tear 
mrs allen mended and sometimes made garments for the girls there were two very plain rooms a sleeping chamber and living room neat as a new pin and there was little sadie allen who years ago had been thrown out of a wagon and crippled so that she seldom left the wheeling chair when her mother was out sewing the days were very long to her i hope they will send me some of the church flowers to-morrow she said wistfully or it will be monday i suppose when they send them around to the hospital and the orphans and the old ladies we had a geranium but mother let it get frosted and it must be just lovely to have a lot of flowers to keep easter with why it would be almost like heaven where everlasting spring abides and never withering flowers alice drew a long breath could she make an easter offering of her first fruits her two lovely lilies that would open their white gates and show their golden treasures to celebrate the resurrection morning no one has thought of poor little sadie allen there would be more lilies out afterward for her but she should feel so proud of them all day long she had meant to carry it down in the library where the girls spent sunday afternoon talking with mrs trevor then she looked at the pale little girl with longing wistful eyes who had so few delights i'll bring you two beautiful lilies in the morning she began hurriedly lest she should repent i don't believe you have ever seen anything like them and they are so delicately fragrant you can have them all day long and you can imagine you are in church the child caught alice's hands and kissed them rapturously but she could not speak and then alice bent over and kissed her and said good-bye in a tremulous voice hurrying away so moved that her own eyes were filled she went to her room and hung her skirt in the closet then crossed to the window oh what had happened the two big lily buds lay on the floor one had opened had there been some untoward condition loosening them before their time what was this she picked up a note with one corner folded directed to miss may anderson the tempest rose mountains high and she caught the chair to steady herself her temples throbbed the blood surged in her ears she could have smashed may's lovely vase or torn to fragments the photograph she valued so highly but she stood quite still if she had conquered other times could she not do it now mamma would be so glad may couldn't have been so cruel as to have done such a deed wilfully and now alice remembered that may had made a great many efforts at carefulness not an article of hers was lying around she stooped and picked up her lilies and somehow couldn't forbear kissing them sadie could have them to-morrow morning all the same since they were not crushed or broken then she finished up her little tablet with a victory it was better oh so much better than the wild passion of anger she would listen to may's explanation and try not to say one angry word then the supper bell rang may anderson had come in to put up her hair afresh it was often coming down she went straight to the mirror and flung her golf cape on the chair with such force it nearly toppled over but she caught it and then she saw the mischief she had done and stood aghast for an instant oh what could she do she was going out with jenny king to buy some easter gifts instead she went to the florist every easter lily was engaged he could have sold twenty more if he had been smart enough to raise them there was another place and she trudged over to that not one could be had for love or money but several of mine are only hired the man said now on tuesday i could sell you one save the most beautiful one you have and send it to mrs trevor's on tuesday there was an end to all other easter gifts for lilies came high at that time she was late for supper how lovely and tranquil alice dane looked she was red and flurried then they brought their lists of endeavors to mrs trevor there was a great fire in the library and as mrs trevor read she smiled and commended every one with a verse from the bible and the red flame swallowed up the confession he that ruleth his spirit is better than he who taketh a city 
came to Alice. How many times Mama had said that to her. Then they had a delightful talk, a sort of conference meeting, before they said good night. I don't know how you can ever forgive me for breaking your lily, cried May as she entered the room. I never thought of it being in this corner, but this was your chair, and I had no business to throw my cape over it. Oh, Alice, don't keep so still. Call me anything. Say the worst things you can. I deserve them all. Even a saint would be angry. I've been trying, and Alice's voice was all of a quiver. There is no sense in having such a horrid temper and saying ugly, shameful things. I know you did not do it purposely. You have been very careful of late, and I promised them away tomorrow morning to little Sadie Allen. See, one is all open. You are an angel. And then the two girls had a little cry in each other's arms. The girls all through the school were surprised that Alice should send away her lovely lilies. But before night, another one came out. They all brought their flowers down and set them on the library table. And some were perfect successes, Mrs. Trevor admitted. One of the happiest souls in all the town that day was Sadie Allen. She did not hear the organ tones, nor the glad rejoicing hymns, nor see the joyous faces only as they went by their out-of-the-way street. But the lilies told her wonderful tales of the land where flowers bloom forever. If you didn't mind very much, Alice said to May, when the splendid lily came that kept May poor for the next fortnight, I'd like this to go to Sadie Allen. It will be your gift, and mine will go on blooming for both of us. It was very generous of you to think of such a return. Oh, Miss Jane, Sadie said afterward, I never knew Easter could be so beautiful. End of an Easter Lily Recorded by Melissa Perry Kathy's Fairyland from An Easter Lily. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Perry. An Easter Lily by Amanda Minnie Douglas. Kathy's Fairyland. Oh dear. And Kathy Alston closed her book with a sigh. If there only were real fairies, if one could wish for things and have it. Then she looked around the room. It was altogether unlike an enchanted palace. A faded and well-worn carpet, cane seat chairs, the chintz cover on the lounge worn at the edges, two or three old-fashioned pictures, and two women, who should have been fairy princesses, instead. And just then it came to Kathy with renewed force, how very hard their life was, her mother sewing wearily day after day to lengthen out their scant income, and poor, pale Aunt Ruth, never strong enough to make any great exertion in the way of working. If she only had a magic lamp to rub, or a purse in which, open it often as she might, she would find a piece of gold. What splendid things she could do for her mother, and Aunt Ruth, and Rob, and Freddy! But she was only a little girl and could not do anything. Kathy, her mother said presently, you must go to the store, and now it is so dark you will not have time to run up to Mrs. Grayson's. Kathy started. Why, the clock was striking five, and the room was already in a haze of twilight. She had been reading just an hour and a half. Twice her mother had spoken to her about going to Mrs. Grayson's, and she had intended to after she read just that page and so she had gone on and on. "'Can't I do it in the morning, Mama? she asked soberly, a little troubled in her conscience. "'No, it would make you late for school. I'll go this evening. Run to the store now, and remember all the things I tell you. Look if you see the boys, and call them in.' Her mother's tired and tender voice touched her, for Kathy had a warm, generous heart. "'Oh, Mama!" I wish I was a fairy for your sake. And Kathy clasped her arms around her mother's neck, kissing her fondly in a repentant mood. There are many kinds of fairies, Mrs. Alston said. They don't all live in enchanted palaces. Then she gave Kathy the basket and some money 
and repeated the list of articles she needed the little girl trudged along in the cold thinking of all the wonderful things that might be done if one had the power and then wondered what her mother meant by saying there were different kinds of fairies of course no one really believed in them charming as the stories were money could do a great many things that seemed almost like magic but she had no money perhaps never would have little girls couldn't earn any and women never became rich when rob and freddy grew to be men but that was a long way off there was a bright little star twinkling up in the sky it looked so oddly at her out of its one golden eye that she couldn't help saying oh you lovely fairy star and somehow it seemed as if the fairies were not all dead but she was at the store before she knew it went in and made her purchases and started for home watching the same beautiful star until she came in sight of the cottage then she drew a long breath of dismay mamma had put a little tin pail in the bottom of the basket and told her to leave it at the baker's going and stop for it coming back oh dear sighed kathy i ought to have a fairy named memory and for an instant she felt tempted to cry should she go home first or carry the heavy basket back to the baker's back to the baker's said the star though i think it was a fairy inside of the little girl called conscience it will teach me a lesson for i am heedless and she turned round instantly then at the baker's she had to take nearly all of the things out of the basket and afterward she hurried home to make up for lost time how quick you have been her mother said with a smile kathy like other children was sometimes given to loitering did you see the boys oh i forgot mamma but i didn't see them nor hear them i'll go look for them looking for the boys was one of kathy's hardships it wasn't pleasant to go out in the cold and hunt round for them the star up in the blue sky seemed to challenge her to a race and in a few seconds she had reached the hill where the boys coasted rob knew it wasn't supper time and didn't want to come in she took freddie by the hand and then charlie darrell wanted her to try just once on his new christmas sled but she declined cheerfully though it was something of a struggle to put the temptation by rob soon followed them i mean to tease mother to let me go out again tonight," he exclaimed all the boys will be there rob kathy said with her heart in her throat i wish you'd do something partly for me instead what rather crossly mamma will have to go to mrs grayson's this evening and i wish you would go with her it will make the walk seem shorter and it is my fault for i read in my fairy book this afternoon when i should have gone bother i wish you'd attend to your own business i'm very sorry rob with an effort you may have my paint box on the first rainy day rob said nothing then and ate his supper rather soberly afterward kathy proposed washing the dishes so that her mother might go immediately mrs alston looked pleased and put on her shawl i'm going along so that no one will run away with you rob announced with an assumption of manliness are you oh thank you then freddie thought he ought to go though the warm room and the warm tea had made him look rather sleepy besides he was too small a boy to take such a tramp after supper i'll put you to bed and tell you a story kathy whispered as the others went away kathy hated washing dishes but she went at it cheerfully now it was surprising how soon she seemed to get through then she brushed up the room drew aunt ruth's chair up to the table for she was an almost helpless invalid and found all her sewing materials fred was nodding in the corner by this time and was rather cross when she roused him but by the time she had him snugly tucked in bed he remembered the story she wrapped a shawl around her and commenced in a bright happy voice why you're almost a fairy yourself fred said pleasantly and a warm glow came to her face as she recalled her mother's words she couldn't transport them all to an elegant palace she could not surround them with luxury not have servants come at her call 
but she began to think of the real fairies there were in the world love to begin with a spirit who was tender patient self-sacrificing never cross when things went wrong never indolent when others around could be saved any toil or burden oh she said with a sigh i can never be such a fairy and she felt very humble but i will try to do a little what are you looking for aunt ruth said as she entered the sitting-room rob told mamma his mittens wanted mending and i thought i could do it and so she did darning very well for a little girl and she was very glad the next morning when she heard rob remind mamma that she had forgotten all about his mittens rob came home in a state of felicity i had a splendid talk with dick grayson he said and he isn't half so proud as the boys make out although he does go to the academy he asked me to come over some evening and oh kathy he has such lots of books and a little study all by himself where he reads and tries experiments and his father is so pleasant and kind mrs grayson praised me for not letting mamma go out alone and i wanted to tell her that it was your thought not mine i ought to do it always and kathy i shall not want the paints at least not for pay you can have them to paint your boat she rejoined yielding of her own free will a point that she had refused rob several times your darling exclaimed rob boy fashion she took a long look at the star before she went to bed did it never get tired shining steadily on and on didn't it want to go to some other place or do something else become a sun a moon for instance as any little boy or girl would in its place god wanted it just to shine and it did its duty and he wanted her to be a helpful little girl or else he would have given her a beautiful house plenty of servants and plenty of money and nothing to do there were princesses in the fairy stories who had everything they called for but the real fairies ran to and fro did as they were bidden and never complained of the hard work and a little while ago she was wishing to be a fairy one of the working kind it must be kathy did not forget her resolves the next morning i don't mean you to think that she did everything without a bit of trouble and that it was easy for her to give up her own wishes and pleasures sometimes it seemed very hard and it was difficult to think in time even when she was quite willing to perform a good action but she remembered the star going on and on and prayed for strength for love instead of wishing for idle things no one can ever have but one day a long while after this something just like a fairy story did happen to kathy coming home from school she found a tall foreign-looking gentleman in the sitting-room talking very familiarly to her mother and aunt ruth cousin robert they called him and then kathy remembered the stories she had heard of cousin robert going to china years and years ago he took her up on his knee and studied her face what a charming little fairy you are he said kissing her and the warm color came to her cheeks i think i shall spirit you away to a palace i am going to have and if your mother and aunt ruth ever want to see you again they must come too it wasn't a palace exactly but a delightful home and cousin robert insisted upon their sharing it with him as he was all alone in the world mrs alston grew young and rosy again when relieved from the necessity of constant toil and aunt ruth always sweet and patient enjoyed many things in the new life but kathy gave a wonderful charm to the household she did not forget the lessons she had learned in adversity and i think she proved a fairy to many outside of her home circle rob and fred always thought her the dearest little body in the world end of kathy's fairyland Albin News found Santa Claus from an Easter Lily. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lewis, Houston, Texas. An Easter Lily by Amanda Minnie Douglas. Albin Hughes found Santa Claus. Section 3 
It had come to be pretty hard lines with us, you see. The governor had never held up his head, so to speak, since the accident on his train. He had been switch tender at North Lumberton Junction for years and years. And I do say he wasn't to blame for the accident then. But biggins always do crowd out little uns, the way it was. There was an extra, you see, going up, excursion train, and no one had telegraphed a sound. The regular train had gone up. The, the down was coming in about ten minutes. Governor went out and fixed the switch and stood there with the flag in his hand, looking up, when something came a thundering along right back at him. Switch right, sung out someone. Governor jumped and was blind confused. The train ran right off and smashed into a lot of coal cars standing there. It was a mercy he wasn't killed. To would have been so much minded being killed at my post like that chap you was reading about the other day, he said to me privately afterwards. But if I'd been killed, I never could have told the truth about myself, though nobody ever write verses about me. If I'd had a gift that way and known any newspapers, man, I'd have done it myself. "'Twasn't so bad as it might have been. "'The smoking car was about empty. "'Engineer give a spring. "'But my, didn't they go to founders? Four killed and lots of em hurt, "'and there was an awful time. "'There was an inquest and testimony about everything. "'The real truth was, "'telegram wasn't quite soon enough. "'But the railroad people wouldn't allow that. "'They compared watches and wangled and talked "'and smoothed matters over for everyone.' but the governor, and he was marched off to jail. Poor Mammy almost broke her heart. She was the governor's second wife. He had some sons, I've heard him say, who were well-to-do men, but they'd forgot all about him. Mammy had had three children, Jack, who was off at sea, Kitty, who had met with an accident and was lame, and me. My name's Benjamin Franklin Hughes, but for short they always call me Ben. Mammy used to read to me on Sundays about Joseph and his breathing, and how the old governor loved Benjamin, and they found the king's cup in his sack of corn. But he come out all right in the end, and I know it give Mamma a good deal of faith about me. Well, my governor had a hard time of it. A man come and told Mammy that it would be better for him to stay in jail a while till folks forgot. So they kept putting off his trial, and blah and by, they sort of let him go with the lecture. But it riled the old man awfully. It was the dead of winter, and he couldn't do anything more at North Lumberton, because, you see, it wasn't made plain, and all hands thought him to blame. So we come to the city. We managed through the summer, but in the fall, the governor was taken to his bed. Mama and Kitty sewed, but there wasn't much made by that, and I was on the lookout for all the odd jobs I could find. When a chap began to go downhill, seems as if it wasn't always freezing weather and slippery, and he slides and slides with nothing to catch hold of till he gets away. Down to the bottom, I seen some good chances to get established if I'd had five dollars or so, but I never did. And then that's regular and fortunate sometimes forget about how it was with themselves in the beginning. Just after Thanksgiving, the chap at Mammy's shop busted. He was owing her five dollars, and the loss come mighty hard. There wouldn't have been anything more for weeks and weeks, for it was a dual winter, and people began to talk about soup houses then. Maybe I might get a few days washing, said Mammy. I'll speak to the neighbors round. I don't know what we're going to do, put in Kitty. She was kind of a pretty little thing with big brown eyes and yellow hair that curled in a slow way and somehow looked like her pale face, not being crisp and kinky like some curly hair. Now and then I'd seen just such a picture in a window, with a hungry look about it, as if the poor soul wanted something that wasn't meat nor drink. She kept a hankering after the little garden we had at Junction, and the green fields all about, but it seemed to me that she looked peekinger than ever now. I remember just as if it was yesterday, about that Sunday before Christmas, I'd had a streak of luck, Saturday night selling in the market. "'There's the rent,' said Mammy, when I come home. "'We mustn't touch a cent of it this week, so as to be sure. "'It was cold and stormy on Sunday. "'I went down to the missionary school after dinner, "'and most of the talk was about Christmas, "'and the Lord being born in a manger, "'and how poor and humble he was, "'and how everyone ought to do some good deed at Christmas, "'if never any other time. 
and how the Lord took these small things as sort of birthday gifts to himself, and remembered everyone, no matter how small it was. I'd often thought I'd like to be rich, and send poor people tons of coal and blankets and a turkey, perhaps, or something good, but I knew I never should be. I was telling them all about it in the evening, and then Kitty and me began to look over the pictures in Mammy's big Bible that was, I don't know how old. We stopped at Joseph being sold by his breathing, and Kitty read the story all over again and how Joseph forgave them when he came to be a great king and brought his father to Egypt so he mightn't starve to death. The governor was laying on his bed, and he gave a great sigh. They don't do so nowadays, he said. They go off and forget. I've three likely sons out in the new countries with flocks and herds and wives and children, but it's many a long year since any of them have asked if I was alive. Am I supposed to bond by Jack be like em? But Ben won't, said Kitty softly. He will be like this one, won't you, Ben? You may bet your life on that, says I. Governor, you cheer up a bit. I've got a good name, and I won't go back on it. Maybe I'll see an opening between this and spring, and you'll come out like a lark some warm day. Somehow it seems to me as if this Christmas was going to be something for us. Oh, said Kitty with a great glow in her eyes. If there only was a real Santa Claus, or if we could have three wishes. And then we planned that we would wish for, and afterwards Mammy asked us to sing. Kitty knew some carols. She was a master hand to remember, and the governor said he did not believe. It was much better out on the plains of Judy, where the shepherds kept watch. But it was, you know, though it was just as well for him to think he had some of the very best. On Tuesday it was, I see one of them lucky chances for a little speculation, and I run home to Mammy for a few dollars. Oh, Ben, she said, we just paid it away. Mr. McCann came in this morning and asked if I had the rent handy. He wanted to use some money and was hard up. It's a mean shame, and I was mad as a hen in a brush fence. He couldn't collect it anyhow till the first, and here it's only the twenty-third. And if I only had two dollars, I know I could double it today and again tomorrow. I'm so sorry, Ben, but then you might have lost it, and we've a roof over our head for all January. Well, it can't be helped, and I started off again. There was another fellow standing by to take the chance. What could I do? The ground was frozen up as dry as a chip, and there was no boots to black except for the regulars. I put in a ton of coal, and that was every living thing I found to do that day. I'd had my eye on a paper route for ever so long, but it just seemed as if I could never get money enough together again for anything and all the streets were looking gay, and the stores and markets trimmed up with evergreens. How jolly everyone seemed. Next day, luck was dead against me again. Seventy-five cents was all I made. Not a stiver for Christmas. I'd seen so many things I wanted to buy Kitty, and I wanted a chicken to make some broth for the governor. I began to wonder if it was all true what the man said on Sunday. Was there a great lord up in heaven who knew all about cold and hunger? and had no place to lay his head, and was at last given up to the cruel Jews to be put to death. That's a sight worse than you, Ben Hughes, I said, and then I ran round looking at the gay shop windows, and listening to the fun and laughs, and now and then a church bell ringing. If Kitty had been strong enough to go with me, it would have been quite a little Christmas feast, but it was an awful cold night. I had an armful of evergreens, for you see, I didn't dare spend any of my money buying Christmas. I was turning around a corner when I saw something huddled up on a step like a great dog. If I was rich, I should have some dogs. I do like em so. I went to pat the shaggy fellow, but when I put out my hand, I found it wasn't a dog at all. Let me be, said the little kid, jerking away. I'm nice and warm in this corner, and I was almost asleep. But you'll freeze here, I said. You'd better go to the station house. No, and he began to cry. I ran away from a pillar. I don't want to go to the island. I want to get up to the heavens where Betty's gone and where the good Lord takes care of little boys like me. I hadn't had a mouthful all day, except the good smell over there, and the man kicked me away. Does it take long to freeze? 
why jimmy arno is it you and i dragged him out to the light sure enough and his teeth were chattering as if they'd been strung on wires the little kid didn't know me he was blinked out of his great black eyes and then began to whimper i knew where he had lived and this betty arno used to keep a peanut stand tis betty dead said i yes and the woman turned me out the doors and wouldn't let me take the box betty gave me oh dear i'm so cold so cold i thought of what the man said at the mission school maybe this was my christmas if doing for such a little chap was just the same as doing for the great lord and if he'd say at the last ben use i saw you that christmas eve when you was too poor to send gifts to anybody taking that half-starved little shaver in out of the cold and i put it down in my count and it's just as good as a rich man's deed so says i come along jimmy i'll give you a nice warm corner to sleep in and a mouthful of supper it's christmas eve you know trot up brisk now the poor little chap was crying and talking all in one breath and wanting to sit down on every stoop but i kept him up here we are says i opening the door oh ben what has kept you so late cries kitty and then in the next breath what a splendid lot of greens and something else said i santa claus why ben says mammy where did you pick up this poor thing oh don't send me to the station house nor the island cries he looking frightened out of his great eyes i never stole anything nor sweared and i'm so cold oh is it nice and warm in heaven betty said it was come to the fire poor creature says mammy i told her about betty arno and her peanut stand and how that i had seen her for as much as a month and jimmy said she was dead and then how i'd found him this bitter cold night and i wanted to keep him just as if it had been the great lord and we'll have some christmas after all says kitty only not like rich folks mammy was afraid he was froze so i brought in some snow and rubbed his ears and nose and his hands then mammy washed him and set him by the stove to warm and dry and give him a little broth first my eyes wasn't the kid hungry if he'd have stayed out in that cold all night i guess he'd have found a short road to heaven sure maybe it would have been better said mammy poor little lambs i like to think god is glad to have them but we'll do our best we can now you must run out and buy us a little dinner for tomorrow, Ben. A bit of beef to stew, I guess, and a few potatoes. I went down to the butcher's. He was hard run just then and asked me to take out a basket to a customer. And afterwards another. I picked out what I wanted and he weighed it. Thirty-five cents, says he, but if you'd like to change, Ben, I'll let you have this chicken. The skin's broken and it doesn't look quite so fair, but it's fresh and a nice plump fellow call it square for the errands thank ye says i and a merry christmas in the bargain lots of em to you ben i run off home glad enough i tell you feeling like a morning star hooray says i opening the door christmas is begun and no mistake what do you think of that the governor was as pleased as a baby and mammy laughed with tears in her eyes then kitty and i sung some rousing carols the little chap was sound asleep the baker sent kitty a cake next day and altogether it wasn't so bad a christmas only the little kid he grew sicker and sicker governor said we ought to send him to the hospital but somehow kitty she took a wonderful fancy to him and mammy was a master hand at nursing then too during the next week i had a streak of luck and made five dollars and mammy had a pile of sewing to do for a neighbor seems as though the little thing had brought us good fortune kitty said with a bright smile oh ben you ought to hear the wonderful things he talks of when the fever's on him gardens and flowers and birds and a beautiful house and a papa was betty armo his grandmother really to suppose so i said he was always a nice little chap and didn't play much with the street cubs perhaps he will tell us all about it when he gets well mammy managed to get the fever broken about two weeks but he was as weak as a baby He'd lie there on two chairs, listening to Kitty as she sung, and begging her to tell him stories. Governor took a queer liking to him as well. We didn't call him anything but Santa Claus. One day Kitty told him what he talked about when he was sick. It's all true, he said. I used to live in the house, my mammy and I, and she had pretty light curls like Kitty. 
and oh such beautiful blue eyes she used to wear silk dresses and had a gold watch and rings and papa used to come and give her heaps of money but one day mammy took me and went away and we never went back to that splendid house and papa didn't come any more she just grew whiter and whiter and when old betty come she went to heaven and left me with granny and that's a long long while ago when i was a little boy mammy shook her head i dare say there's been some sorry work about it there's a many sad things in this world don't you believe it's true it's true enough said mammy with a sigh times begin to get pretty hard with us again february was cornering on and no rent twas always paid in advance you see or else you had to march old mccain came in and made a row if you don't have it to-morrow at twelve out you go says he you can borrow it from some friend i know we had a little bread and lasses for supper that night i made believe i wasn't a bit hungry and kept feeding the little kid cause i didn't know what would happen to him or any of us to-morrow you see not being brought up in the city i wasn't used to all the dodges and way of getting along well you took him in and give him a good christmas says kitty and we won't be sorry for he did bring us a little luck only i can't bear to think of turning him out again just then there was a knock at the door i opened it and two men stood there is little jimmy arno here says one of them with that he ran and hid his head in mammy's lap oh he screamed it's a peeler don't let him take me i won't go to the island i'll run away and drown we don't want anybody to go to the island says the policeman tell the truth for it's all good news little cove you're about the luckiest chap i ever heard tell of is this the boy said the other man picked jim up in his arms and turned him to the light oh he says in kind of a crying tone i should know them eyes anywhere my good woman i've never can repay you for sheltering this little boy he's my grandson with that the governor came out and dropped in a chair somehow says he he never seemed like a common child but we must know the truth and your claim before you take him away from here i declare i was so proud of my governor for that speech that i could have cheered they sat down and talked i don't know so if i've got that story straight in my head to this day but it was something like this the old gent's son married a pretty actress who was betty arno's daughter but he kept mighty still about it to his folks somehow after a while they quarrelled and he told her she wasn't his wife with that she ran away taking her little kid and when she was most a dying she sent for her mother old betty and told her the story and gave jim to her and a box of papers that was more than two years before and now jim's father was dead and there had come a great fortune for him and his heirs which was little jim here they'd found where betty died and they'd taken the box from the woman who'd turned jim out of doors and found letters and a certificate which proved all about him and now for a month they'd been hunting up jim mammy had told a neighbor about my bringing him home almost starved and frozen and how sick he'd been and she happened to see the stir about it in a paper with the reward offered so she went and told the old gent the news jim says he i'm your grandfather your poor papa died a loving you and sorry enough that he had ever been so cruel and now you must come home with me and i'll try to bring you up to be a good man and you must love me in my old days ah said the governor they don't always do that unless they're like ben here i've three likely sons that i have never heard from in ten years or more so the old gent thanked mammy again and again and said so much to me that i was red as a beet in the face but would you believe the little kid wouldn't stir a step with them without kitty and mammy begged him to wait till tomorrow well they went away after a while and we talked and cried even to the governor who was quite knocked up about it jim seemed to care the least of any one but then he didn't understand all was going to be to him but twasn't there a jolly lark the next morning old mccann was there ordering us out of the house just as the carriage stopped you should have seen his face then it was as good as a picture by nast he cooled down quicker and last his candy in a heap of snow the old gent paid the rent and told him we didn't want the place any more and sure enough before twelve that day 
we went out bag and baggage which wasn't saying much after all well the upshot of it all is i've got about as nice a paper stand as you'd want to see we keep pens and writing paper and notions and i've a morning route i'm first president of the governor's cashier and you never saw a prouder man we have three rooms back of the store and mammy keeps house there like a queen kitty is living with mr wassenham and jimmy though his real name is eugene they wouldn't a give her up you see the old gent felt as if we had saved jimmy's life and i do suppose the little kid would have froze to death that night if i hadn't a taken him home so he felt as if it couldn't a do enough for us but the governor and i we've got our pride too kitty lives like a princess in a palace she takes care of jim's clothes and dusts up the parlors and is studying music for they all think she has a stunning voice she comes to see us in a carriage and though the governor laughs i see him wipe his eyes with his coat sleeve as though there was a little something besides fun in it you'd better believe that i put faith in santa claus and christmas while the year couldn't keep house without them the governor and i hang up our stockings and keep em full too it's quarries but there's always on christmas eve i take a little run just after dark and look on store steps and in dry goods boxes and sometimes i find a little chap cold and hungry and i make believe for a moment that i'm santa claus it's just jolly i tell you and when the stars shine out i think of plain old judy and the shepherds here in the great song that all the world goes on singing so that it may never be quite forgotten so merry christmas to everybody from ben hughes end of how ben hughes found santa claus recording by kristen lewis houston texas grace's holiday from an easter lily this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Adamson An Easter Lily by Amanda Minnie Douglas Grace's Holiday A splendid long holiday, Grace Howard exclaimed, rushing across the porch, fairly out of breath. Some important business calls Miss Johnson away tomorrow, and we girls have been planning such a nice time. Jenny Carlton has asked us to her house to dinner, and then we are going to the woods on a picnic. I thought you didn't like Jenny Carlton very well, Miss Howard rejoined. Grace coloured. There was a sort of chronic difference between the two. I don't like her as well as some of the girls, but we have made up good friends. And when she asked me, it's to be quite a select party. And Grace put a peculiar emphasis upon the word. That is what I object to the most. If all the schoolgirls were going to the woods, I should expect you to have a pleasant time. But choosing some six or eight because their parents are wealthy seems too exclusive for such an occasion. I do not feel at all complimented by having you invited. But I do want to go. My holiday will be just spoiled if I have to stay at home. And Grace's pretty face looked ready for tears. Perhaps you might decide upon some better way of spending it, replied her mother. I am going to drive to Aunt Ellen's in the afternoon and had thought of taking you. Mrs. Dean was over here this morning and said that Alice was wishing very much to see you. She seems to be failing, her mother fancies. Half a day would finish your book, wouldn't it? I'll do that positively on Saturday, Grace said, or I might go a little while on Friday afternoon. Oh dear, I shall be glad when it is through. You know it was your own desire, Mrs. Howard rejoined, and it has been such a pleasure to Alice. Grace twisted the fringe of the table cover with a misgiving that she was not in a very amiable frame of mind. A day or two surely wouldn't make any difference to Alice Dean, but to give up a whole day's pleasure for that? Grace Howard had a good many generous impulses, but, one way and another, her undertakings often failed before reaching completion. She had received for her birthday present a handsome set of story books in which she had been wonderfully interested and proposed to read them aloud to blind Alice Dean, who was an invalid besides. Mrs. Dean had to work hard to support herself and child, and found but little time to devote to her amusement. Grace's clear, sweet voice gave them a keener charm to the sensitive child. At first she had done very well, it must be confessed, but the last book dragged along when Grace began to think it almost a burden. 
Can't I go, she said presently. I shall be so disappointed. I believe your days with Jenny Carlton have always been failures. Still, I will not compel you to give up this one. Think it over before you decide. Grace's face brightened immediately, which showed that there was to be very little consideration. Just now she was intent upon her own pleasure. Jenny had urged her strongly, and somehow Grace always felt flattered by Jenny Carlton's notice. They lived in a grand house, and Jenny held herself above most of the schoolgirls. Mr. Carlton and Mr. Howard being very warm personal friends, Mrs. Howard had found it impossible to regulate the intercourse of the children without giving offence, and Mr. Howard indulged his little girl in almost every whim. But it frequently happened that Grace was hardly upon speaking terms with Jenny, for the latter gave her an occasional rebuff that was not easy to bear. Grace thought of nothing but the pleasure now. She was all impatience for the hour to come, and set off to Jenny's in high spirits. The woods were on Mr. Carlton's place, about half a mile from the house, and there could be no possible danger to the party. "'I hope you will have a nice day,' Mrs. Howard said, kissing her, "'and when you return from the woods, come home immediately.' Grace promised. As she walked across the lawn to Mr. Carlton's, she saw two strange figures in the little group. A girl, taller than Jenny, and a boy older still, and then she looked at her printed cambric in dismay. Jenny wore her braided pique and an elegant sash, while she had on an ordinary school dress. The young lady stared at her superciliously, and when Jenny introduced her as her cousin, Grace remembered having seen her at church once. They had just arrived an hour or so ago. For a moment Grace felt half inclined to excuse herself and return home. The drive with her mother would be pleasant, and it was always nice at Aunt Ellen's but she felt a little ashamed to confess her mistake so soon. The rest of the girls came presently. They all laughed and talked, went to Jenny's playroom, and looked over the dolls and books and curious toys, and then Mrs. Carlton summoned them to lunch. After that began the preparation for going to the woods. Mrs. Carlton told them she thought they had better stay around the house and amuse themselves by playing croquet and other games, but Jenny's cousin Horace whispered to her that he thought it a bore. They started off presently, with a servant to carry some luggage for them. It was a warm walk to the woods, but, once there, they found it cool and shady. They amused themselves a while with play, and then Horace wondered if they couldn't find something better to do. "'Where's Uncle's boat?' he asked. "'I might give you all a sail.' "'Oh, splendid!' exclaimed Jenny. "'Let us go down to the river,' and she and Horace headed the party. "'What are you lagging for, Grace Howard?' I think we ought not, Grace said with sudden courage. Mamma wouldn't like it. What a baby. You'd better go back if you're afraid. Pooh, said two or three of the others, and Grace's resolution wavered. They kept on, and she followed slowly. Jenny began to show her vexation, for she could not endure that anyone should interfere with her plans. Presently they reached the river's edge. All this time Grace had been debating within herself. She had been positively forbidden to go upon the river, but how lovely it looked in the shimmering light. Spikes of crimson cardinal flowers lined the shore, and further down there were clusters of lilies. She need not tell, and perhaps her parents would never hear. Well, Miss Tender Conscience, began Jenny mockingly, what shall you do? Grace flushed redly. You're a little marplot and everything, putting on airs as if you were better than other people. I'm sorry I asked you, I'll never invite you anywhere again. That made Grace angry, and she answered back. One or two of the girls would have taken her part, but they were restrained by their girlish admiration of Jenny, so poor Grace had to fight her battle alone, but that gave her the bravery she needed. She turned proudly away. Let her go, said Horace. What's the use of making such a row? Alone by herself, Grace began to weep passionately, and declare, as she had several times before, that she would never go anywhere again with Jenny. She sat down under a tree, feeling utterly miserable. Her day was a failure. Not an hour of it had been real happy. If she had taken her mother's advice, would it be too late to go and read to Alice? Then her day would not be entirely wasted. A gay laugh floated from the river, and for half a moment she wished herself with the girls. It is best and right, she said reluctantly, and began to find her way out of the wood. It was a long walk to Mrs. Dean's cottage. She was warm and tired when she reached the place, and still nervous from her recent dispute. But Alice recognised the voice and held out her thin white hand. I'm so glad you've come. 
and a little flush brightened her face. Grace did not feel much like talking, so she found her book and began to read, growing more tranquil with the effort. Presently her old interest in the story returned, and she went on until Mrs. Dean began to set the supper table. "'You must have a cup of tea with Alice,' Mrs. Dean said. "'I don't believe your mamma will be displeased.' Alice was delighted to be propped up in her easy chair by the table. The two girls had a nice, cosy time, as delightful as the supper in the woods, Grace thought, but Alice was very tired afterward. "'Perhaps I had better not finish,' Grace said, glancing at the book. "'Oh, do, please. I am so interested,' and Grace read on to the last word. "'I don't know how I can ever thank you. It has been such a pleasure to hear them all. And, Gracie, if you would only sing Glory to Thee, my God, is it too late?' Grace sat on the edge of the bed and sang in her sweet voice, which was calm and musical enough now. Alice held her hand all the while. "'Oh,' she said, "'what a lovely afternoon it has been. How good you are, Grace!' Not very, said Grace soberly, for yesterday she had thought this work of love a hardship. I wish I could be real good. Alice kissed her tenderly and made her promise to come soon again. It was dusk when Grace reached home. Mamma returned soon after, and, at the first glimpse of her daughter's face, asked tenderly if she had enjoyed herself all day. Come, sit down and let me talk to you, Mamma. I didn't have the pleasure I expected, but I had something better afterward. It's quite a story, and I think you're right about Jenny Carlton. She is proud and selfish and disagreeable. I don't say that. There may be some fault in you as well. I get angry easily, and then Jenny calls me Spitfire. And I wasn't good today, only I did obey you in one thing. So Grace told her story. My darling, how thankful I am that you had the courage to do right. And Mrs. Howard drew her daughter closer to her heart. Don't praise me, Mamma. Perhaps if Jenny had been sweet and pleasant, I might have been tempted to go. But I am so glad I read to Alice. Oh, Mamma, your plan for the day was better than mine. I wish I could always think so in the beginning. We all gain a good deal of our wisdom by experience, my little girl, but now you must go to bed, for I think you have had enough excitement for one day. It was quite late when Grace came down the next morning. Ah, honey, said Bridget, you may be glad you didn't go sailing with the girls. They were upset, and Miss Jenny came near getting drowned. Someone stood on the porch. It was Mrs. Dean's nearest neighbour, and Grace ran out to ask after Alice. She's up in heaven, miss, answered the woman solemnly. She died in the night, as peaceful as she always lived. If ever there was an angel, she is one. Oh, Mamma, said Grace, with her eyes full of tears. It is better to make others happy than to be thinking only of oneself. I am so glad now. And when she looked on Alice Dean's still white face, she prayed that she might be less selfish and more thoughtful for the happiness of those around her. End of Grace's Holiday Recording by Jenny Adamson Gone Astray from an Easter Lily This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Easter Lily by Amanda Minnie Douglas Gone Astray The Crosby boys knew little Miss Wing by sight. She went to the same church and had a seat in the same aisle, nearer down by the door. An odd, quaint body, not larger than a girl of fourteen, with white side curls done upon combs. Once they had been flaxen. Her face was wrinkled, but her step retained all its youthful quickness, though her voice had a little cracked sound. Then she lived in the same street, a nest of a cottage painted brown but overgrown with vines, one large window full of flowers in winter, and in summer the prettiest garden for the size that you could imagine. It was Miss Wing's delight. Early and late you might find her working in it. Then she had an enormous Angora cat a dainty little King Charles Spaniel, and canary birds by the dozens. Here she lived with old black Hannah, her one servant-maid, for she had come here with her father when she was quite a young girl. At that time the place had been country indeed. Now the city was stretching out to it. People of means had built pretty villas and cottages along the street, and it had become quite stylish. The Crosbys lived at the end nearer the city. One day, 
Miss Wing had a letter from her cousin, who was a travelling agent for a commercial house, a widower with an only son, thirteen years of age. "'I want to send Frank to you,' he wrote, "'and please do not refuse me. He has been two years at boarding school and has given out. He always was rather delicate. The doctor says he must spend at least six months in the country running about and hardly looking inside a book. None of his mother's people can take him, and I am compelled to go south and west immediately.' I will pay you well for your trouble, for I know that you will take good care of him. Just let him play around and have a good time." Little Miss Wing read the letter in the utmost consternation. What could she do with a boy? Then she went out to consult Hannah, who was much astonished at her mistress. Still, she hadn't the heart to refuse, especially as this cousin had been like a brother to her. And so in May Frank Murray came, his sole companion a travelling trunk a pale, slender boy, neither pretty nor plain exactly, but with great soft dark eyes. She took him to her heart at once. He was a regular boy, a boy who for three years had not known a mother's care or a home. He tormented the cat and cut off his whiskers. He stuck Tiny's silken coat full of dry burrs that he found somewhere. He stumbled over the flower-beds, brought in loads of dirt that vexed Hannah's cleanly soul, and made a commotion in the house generally. Yet he was not a bad boy. He had days of being very good and obedient to Aunt Sarah, but he was restless, and most of all wanted companionship. There were very few boys in the street. Up above, a family that Miss Wing did not admire very much, two sharp, shrewd boys who sold papers and did various little odd jobs to earn money, and then spent it in folly. Their father was not a very steady man, and their mother did dressmaking for the neighborhood around a thriftless kind of household, not at all to Miss Wing's taste. But the Crosbys had won her heart. Three fine, sturdy boys, sixteen, fourteen, and twelve, and then there were two little girls, younger. They always went to church on Sunday with their parents, were regular at Sunday school, and everybody spoke in their praise. Then they seemed to have such a happy time playing ball and croquet in their own grounds, or reading under the shady trees. The first Sunday Frank had a headache and did not go out. On the second he went to church, but he did not want to attend Sunday school, as he didn't know any of the boys. Miss Wing studied a long while on the subject, and at last her courage was brought to the point by a remark of Frank's. "'I'd like to know those Crosby boys,' he said earnestly. "'They seem to have such jolly times. I watched them playing croquet yesterday. It's awful dull here, Aunt Sarah.' She had a misgiving that it was, though she tried to make it as entertaining as possible taking him downtown of errands and trying to instruct him in gardening, for which he had very little taste, it must be confessed. They came up the street one evening and found the three boys on the grassy slope of the lawn, looking very bright and happy. Miss Wing made a little halt, and cast her eyes wistfully toward them. "'Good evening,' said Randolph, the eldest, with a bow and a pleasant smile. They were always very polite. Miss Wing's heart was up in her throat. Here was her golden opportunity, and another might not occur in a long while. "'If you will be kind enough,' and she paused, turning quite red. "'If we can be of any service,' and the courteous Arthur sprang up. "'I would like to introduce my nephew to you. He is a stranger, and going to spend the summer with me, and is a good deal at a loss for companions. If you would come and see him—' "'Thank you. He must come in and see us,' and the three boys responded to the introduction. You always appear to be enjoying yourself so much here. There are so many of you, and you can hardly realize how lonely it is for one, she exclaimed in a confused, hesitating way. The boys chatted a little. Frank was delighted. Aunt Sarah saw the happy light in his eyes, and was quite satisfied with her experiment. I hope they'll come soon, said Frank, as they resumed their walk. They're like the oldest boys at school, and ought to make the first move. I think they will, Aunt Sarah returned hopefully. The Crosby boys spoke of the incident at the supper-table. "'Yes, I've seen the little fellow,' said Mr. Crosby. "'He cannot be Miss Wing's own nephew, though, if his name is Murray. "'I think it would be better to know a little more concerning him before he is admitted to much intimacy,' said Mrs. Crosby. "'I do not like making up with strangers.' "'There's something about his face that I don't quite like,' remarked Arthur, who was rather fastidious. "'But he has such beautiful eyes,' said little Walter and I suppose he must be lonesome. Still, it is best not to go too hastily into friendships. Boys cannot be too careful, replied their prudent mother. 
Mrs. Crosby was a trifle exclusive. She was also proud of her children, and took the utmost pains with them. Never were boys more carefully guarded, never was home made more delightful. They had their friends, too, but she always exercised the casting vote in such matters. Frank had made a slight acquaintance with Dan and Johnny Price, the other two boys in the street, but, knowing that Aunt Sarah disapproved, he said little about it. The next day, however, rambling down to the river, he found them there fishing, and in boys' parlance they had rather a jolly time. Dan was a sharp, droll fellow, and kept Frank laughing heartily at his jokes. He hurried home by the time the Crosby boys usually returned from school. "'Do you believe they will come to-day, Aunt Sarah?' he asked, after he had fidgeted about a while, and she had tried very hard not to be nervous. "'Not so soon, perhaps,' in the most soothing tone. "'Oh, dear, I'd rather be back at school. How dull it is without anybody!' I wish I could make it brighter for you, Frank, and Aunt Sarah's eyes filled with tears. Oh, you are good enough. Then the boy's restless eyes wandered down the street. If there only was someone to play with, to talk to, or even to share a walk. After the crowd of boys at school it was very lonesome indeed, and somehow the Crosby seemed so much nicer than Dan Price. And so another afternoon of expectation passed. Frank recalled the bright faces with a feeling of keen disappointment. Toward night he walked down past the house. They had some company and were very gay, and somehow a few tears came into the eyes of the lonely boy. They did not see him, of course. Dan Price happened along just then. "'What a stuck-up set those Crosby boys are,' he said. "'They think because their father's in a bank and they go to the academy they're better than anyone else.' "'Do they?' "'Why, they won't speak to nobody.' "'And that Arthur's a regular Miss Nancy. "'He always does look so fine.' "'I wonder if they think themselves above me,' ruminated Frank. "'At school such snobbishness would soon have been taken out of a boy.' "'I wish you'd gone downtown with us. "'I made thirty-four cents and had some oysters and some root-beer. "'I say, won't you go to-morrow?' "'I don't know,' rather hesitatingly. "'Won't your aunt let you?' "'Oh, I do not ask her.' returned Frank, with an assumption of mannishness. Dan went on describing the fun they had. There were such crowds of boys downtown, a jolly set, always ready for a lark. It did look rather tempting to Frank, and he partly promised. Aunt Sarah wanted him to take a walk in the woods with her, though she was going principally for his pleasure. But then some ladies came in to call. So Frank rambled off, found Dan and Johnny, who had pretty good luck selling out their papers. Then, as it was a warm day, they had a glass of cream soda with wine instead of syrup. A lady stood at the opposite counter buying several articles, but Frank did not notice her. It was Mrs. Crosby. That evening at the dinner-table she said, "'Boys, I very much prefer that you should not make any intimacy with that Frank Murray. I saw him in a drug store with those Price children, taking sherry in his soda, and the prices are low and ill-bred. I do not wish you to have any such associates.' "'I wish those boys were not in the neighborhood,' rejoined Mr. Crosby. "'We can avoid them, at all events. "'The boys have enough acquaintances who are worthy, "'so it is not worth while to run any risk with those who are not. "'I own that I am afraid of evil associates.' "'Mr. Crosby sighed. "'He was superintendent of a mission Sunday school, "'and he thought of the many boys that were led astray by wicked companions. "'But he did not think that here was a chance to save one right by his door.' Frank merely said he had been downtown, in answer to Aunt Sarah. He had been trying to smoke a cigar, and so could not eat any supper, but went to bed early. He waited a week for the Crosby boys to call upon him, and at last ventured himself. He found them very polite, but he missed the hearty, boyish friendliness to which he had been accustomed. He played a game of croquet, and then a cousin called to see Arthur. Randolph was rather too old for Frank, but he fancied that he should like Walter very much. When he went away, the child asked him to come again. "'I couldn't help it, mother,' he said. "'He had such sad, longing eyes. "'But I do not wish you to go there.' Miss Wing made another effort. She mentioned Frank to the superintendent of the Sunday school, and he sent one of the teachers to call. But the gentleman came one evening after the boy was in bed. By dint of much persuasion, she induced Frank to go the next Sunday, but he was placed in a class with Arthur Crosby, and he concluded that Arthur was proud and stuck up, as Dan had said. Then Dan coaxed him to go to the chapel with him, which was quite a walk down in the city. 
after a sunday or two they spent all the time in walking though he did not tell aunt sarah this nor of many other things that he well knew she would disapprove if there had only been some one to save him if this happy mother could only have opened her heart a little and taken in the motherless child if these bright young boys with all their advantages could have sympathized with his loneliness and given him what he most needed pure and good companionship it would have made so much difference with him for he was worth saving when he first came to his kind aunt who would have done anything for him he had no bad habits but it is so easy to fall into them first frank began to deceive aunt sarah then he contracted a taste for liquor and learned to smoke he fell in with some of dan's associates used every art in his power to get money from his aunt and at last did not hesitate long at crime the three boys found a pocket-book one day containing nearly fifty dollars dan was for dividing it but at first frank said it ought to be taken to the police station at last he was overruled for they all wanted money so they bought cream and soda and candies hired a boat and went up the river and took dinner at a hotel two other boys were invited and they finished in the evening by going to the theater aunt sarah was dreadfully troubled she conjured up many terrible things and was so thankful at last to see him return in safety but poor frank was very sick that night and the next day aunt sarah shed many bitter tears over him had she not tried to her utmost no one had come forward to help her and yet every one talked of the work that was to be done in saving these young souls oh if they could be saved before they went too far astray looking over a paper an advertisement caught frank's eyes a poor woman had lost a pocket-book containing forty-six dollars all she had in the world for herself and her three little children five dollars reward was offered frank knew it well by the description this poor woman's money had been idled away in something worse than folly he was actually a thief perhaps the children were starving oh what could he do day after day he lay there on the sofa considering could he confess it would aunt sarah ever forgive him and oh what would his father say i am glad to tell you that he did take this step at last though it was a hard struggle he and aunt sarah cried together over the terrible story and she even offered to refund the whole amount on condition that frank would give up the prices and all the evil habits that he had contracted poor fellow he found it no easy work but he did try aunt sarah he said one day i know i shouldn't have been half so bad if the crosbys had cared to be friends with me she thought so too oh it is not the bad boys only who need to be saved and the people who pass by on the other side rarely do all they might our neighbors are near as well as far off god help us to do our duty by them the end end of gone astray end of an easter lily by amanda minnie douglas